the industrialization of genocide, including the mass murder of six million Jews at the hands of a heinous fascist Nazi regime. Hitler's final solution to the so-called Jewish <coughs> question. The attempt to erase an entire people, otherwise known as the Holocaust. The Jews call it the Shoah, the catastrophe. Also an abject failure. In this case, victory is marked by the survival of the Jewish people. It is a failure because Joey Drillings and his children exist. The Nazi regime required the elimination of any true system of justice. It also required the denial and acquiescence of countless persons who did not directly participate. And it was based at its core on a rotten lie. The lie that the Jewish people were not people at all, but a subhuman race that was responsible for Germany's loss in the first World War, and it was based on the deranged fantasy that their elimination from Europe and the world would allow for a superhuman Aryan race to rule in a thousand year wreck. Why here? Why are we in a courtroom talking about this? Why did I start doing this last year before a much smaller crowd? Why in a courtroom? I believe that it is fitting and proper for a simple reason. That horror required the absence of truth, and therefore the absence of justice. In this courtroom, in this American system of justice, every day we seek the truth so that we can attempt to deliver justice. We do that every day. And we decide cases based almost exclusively on sworn testimony. And we'll be doing that today. And after we hear that sworn testimony, we'll have a few remarks, and then I would encourage everybody to talk amongst yourselves. Ladies and gentlemen, I call to the stand. <clears throat> former Sullivan County Assistant District Attorney, former Ulster County District Attorney, current Senior Assistant Public Defender, all of our colleague, and my friend, Joey Drillings. Mr. Drillings, if you could step up. I'm gonna ask Lieutenant Brian Fuller whose last day in our courthouse, unfortunately, is February 1st. <clears throat> Lieutenant Fuller, could you please swear in the witness? Hear you right there. Do you swear to affirm that the testimony you're about to hear before this court will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth for us? Yes, I do. State your name for the record. Joey Z. Drilling. Your name for the record. Uh, Joey Z. Drillings. Mr. Drillings. Who was Raymond Drillings? Uh, Raymond Drillings is my father. Uh, he was born April 4th, uh, 1926, in the uh, Polish town of uh, Zhezhov uh, in 1926. Uh, uh, in 1939, he was one of uh, 14,000 Jewish people still residing in Zhezhov. He was 14 years old. He had just had his bar mitzvah when the Germans invaded Poland and seven days later uh, took over his city. 
By the time he returned there in 1945, there were less than 100 Jewish people left there. His father was Jacob. His father owned a cattle farm. His mother was Fega. He had brothers Irving and Joseph, and a younger sister named Rose. Everybody was terminated in concentration camp, uh, other than his brother Irving, uh, who saved his life and whose life he saved. Um, on July 24th, 1942, he watched his parents, his brother Joseph and his uh, sister Rose get loaded onto a train without even being able to say goodbye and never saw them again. They were driven, they were trained to Auschwitz. And as my father used to say, nobody ever got off the train uh, alive. When he left Zhezhov, uh, it was in December of 1943. Um, he was put in a line of people to, uh, to be brought to a death camp while his brother was put in a line of people to be brought to a war camp. The first thing I learned about my father is how unassuming he was and that helped him that day because unaware of what he had done, he was able to sneak over to where his brother was and by being able to sneak over and not have anybody notice him, he <coughs> saved his own life and was able to live with his brother. Uh, being brought to the first concentration camp, a working concentration camp in Mielitz. He was there from 1943, of, of January 1943 until July of 1944, at which point Again, him and his brother were separated on a train platform. This time, he was on the train to go to another work camp. His brother was on the train to go to a death camp. He was upset, but somehow, and to know my father was to love him, he actually had the German soldiers, when he worked in the kitchens and when he worked around and he shined their shoes, that actually liked him and they saw that he was upset and probably the one German soldier who would have done something about it uh, asked him why he was upset. And my father uh, told him that his brother was in the other line, was gonna die, was his only family member. And the guard actually grabbed my uncle and threw him at my father and said, now will you please be quiet? And saved his life. My uncle told me that story probably two days before my father passed away in 2002. They were brought to the second work camp, which was a salt mine, where my father witnessed Jewish person after Jewish person get electrocuted because, as any chemist knows, water, electricity, and salt are sure to cause instant death. And he watched numerous people just get electrocuted doing their job in the bottom of a cave somewhere underground in, in Poland. Finally, in September of 1944, with the Allied forces closing in on some of these camps, my father and his uh, brother were moved to Flossenburg. Uh, it was in April of 1945 from Flossenburg that my father uh, partook in a death march from, from Flossenburg to, to Dachau on April 19th of 1945. If you couldn't make it on that walk, my father said that they were shooting anybody who fell, anybody who got hurt, anybody who got sick. My, my uncle had fallen and had cut a gash in his face and him, my father, and 25 other people in their group carried him so that he wouldn't be left behind where they would hear the gunshots of people being left in ditches on the road. On April 23rd, 1945, the the Mountain Tank Division 537, under the, under the leadership of General Patton, um, as my father said, came flying over a mountain and uh, 
All they saw was a five-point star. Um, the Russians told them it wasn't theirs because it wasn't red. Um, and the Germans just ran for the for the woods. Didn't shoot them. They just they just ran away. And uh, my father said that the, the tank drivers, the nine tanks that pulled up, um, gave them water, gave them candy. That you could see in their faces how shocked they were. And they basically. My father said at that point, we were surrounded by Americans and we, none of us knew what to do. We didn't know to go left, we didn't know to go right, we didn't, we didn't know anything. Thankfully, the US military, to which I am indebted, my, my life is indebted to them, um, took my father and his brother in, allowed them to work for them, um, mainly as, as people who identified Nazi soldiers Nazi uh, people who ran camps, anybody who worked there. My father would later testify in numerous trials, uh, including Joseph Schwamberger in, in New York City. The military was also kind enough to bring my father and his brother to America uh, as a person of interest um, who worked with them, who was loyal to them, it was here that they found one of their uh, uncles, an uncle who had left Germany uh, a year before, had been warned of what was, it, what was on the horizon. Uh, and thankfully, they were able to come over here, and live with them, and get their feet on the ground. For the next 50 years, he worked at the Concord Hotel. There's a, an article I was showing people from 1987 that the LA Times wrote when the hotel started dying uh, about they can use some laughs now. My father, throughout all of this, and I, I still don't understand how, kept his sense of humor, um, kept his shtick, would make people laugh every day, even when, uh, even when he didn't feel like it. I only saw the man cry once in my lifetime. It was on Yom Kippur, 1996, and it finally, I guess, hit him. Uh, my mother used to say that, that he'd have nightmares. What makes this, I don't know if the word's ironic or coincidental, <coughs> my daughter, who's born uh, a year after he passed away, and, and who we named after her, Rachel, went to Europe uh, over um, over Christmas and she made a point of going to Flossenburg. And she texted me that she's standing where Grandpa Raymond was dead 80 years ago. And she bought a necklace with the hand of God, which is a brooch that's supposed to protect you from evil. And I just thought how crazy it was that my beautiful daughter was in a place that my father had horrible nightmares about. Then of course, in 2002, I mentioned my father passed away, and about three days or four days before she pa he passed away, my mother called me and said, he's having terrible nightmares. Your brother can't handle it, can you please come by? And I came by, I slept over and he was had cancer. His colon cancer had metastasized to his, his liver, his lungs, his brain. And in the middle of the night, my mother came over and woke me up. She goes, he's having a nightmare. And I go over and all I keep hearing him say is, get away from me, you Nazi bastards. And I'm like, Dad, I'm here. And he goes, Joey, please help. Please save me. And I'm like, Dad, you're not in Nazi Germany. 
And he goes, please, Joey, help me. Please help me. And I can tell you that there's no more frustrating feeling in the world than to give them your father. Wake up from this thing. For 30 years, I've been involved in, in public service for, as the judge said, Sullivan County, uh, Ulster County. For 30 years, I've, I've fought against what I believe to be injustices, whether it was as a prosecutor or as a defense attorney. I myself have been the victim of bullying on numerous occasions, but like my father, I just became wallpaper. I didn't fight it. I found it amazing that, like in Germany, nobody came to my help. Nobody came to try to help carry me out. Until it finally became enough for a couple of people one of whom was the Honorable, Honorable Brian Rounds. Another one was my chief assistant, my boss at the time, Michael Cavanaugh. They were one of a handful of people that helped get me through a period of time where I was being bullied. I was being the focus of attention for all the wrong reasons and nothing I could do was right. I was a, a veteran of 47 felony trials and hundreds of misdemeanor trials, and nothing I could do in that court was right. I was just being abused to the point where I would go home. I would tell, at the time, my wife, my kids, I was just a hard day at work, and I wouldn't explain it to them. And Judge Rounds, uh, my friend, Mayor Major Gold, Mike Cavanaugh, were some of the people that stood up for me to that individual who was bullying me, who had all the authority in the world and I had nothing, but these three people found it in their hearts to, to lift me up, to tell me that it's going to be okay, we're here with you. They had no reason to, but they did. Just like the, the citizens who used to give my father a loaf of bread to bring back to his camp. Just like the German soldiers who didn't kill them even though they could have killed everyone. Uh, I guess it's not all bad. Um, in 1998, while on my honeymoon, I was in um, Vienna, Austria. We were hiking. I ran into a young man and had breakfast with him. He was our age and he's like, he was state age from Germany and we got into a conversation. His father was a Nazi soldier. And he said his father was young. His father swears to him he never killed anybody, but he had to do what he had to do. And he says his father had lived the last 42 years, 46 years, whatever it was, in a deep state of depression from what he saw. And for me, it just came as a shock because I only thought the Jewish people suffered. The Jews suffered, the mentally ill suffered, Soldiers suffered, people suffered. So I sat through the judge's introduction where he thanked everyone for being here, but truly I don't know if I'd still be in this courthouse. I'd still be practicing representing people if not for, for the Honorable Brian Rounds. As he stated, he's a friend, but he's also a mentor and somebody who helps me come to work every day, always makes me laugh, recently has attempted to make me cry, <laughs> and has put all this together along with, with I, I feel like it's, it's not saying enough about them, but Lindsay Shams, his assistant, um, who I don't know how this court would run without her, um, Christy 
and our stenographer, all the court officers. I've never, somehow never had a court officer or jail officer ever appear here that I didn't get along with, who wasn't one of the nicest guys. I don't know how we get so lucky here. Craig's standing over there smiling. He's one of my best friends. It's okay, I'd like to play um, some video clips. I took probably about five clips, about a couple minutes a piece from my father's. Um, in 1995, Steven Spielberg, um, after Schindler's List, had uh, either founded or helped the Shoah Foundation um, interview a bunch of uh, concentration camp survivors. Um, my dad was the was one of them, my uncle was another one. Uh, my mother often referred to them as the Steven Spielberg tapes that she had in the closet. Uh, I did not realize that they were actually online until last year. I downloaded them, um, I shared them with the judge. Um, but they're tough to get through. Let me tell you, I the first time I went through with them, it was barely at 10, 15 minutes a clip, first of all. There's my father I haven't seen in 20 years. But he's talking about so much that I never heard before, I never thought of. We just kind of, for us it was the Holocaust, it was a word. He never told us anything about it. We imagined, because there was always kind of that gray cloud hanging around our house, you know? So, so if it's okay, I would like to step down and, and play some of those videos. Which you couldn't escape because the whole camp was surrounded with electric wire, but somehow they gave us KL and then they gave us haircuts that uh, just to, to insult the more the character of us. So they gave us, they didn't give us haircuts, they just cut a, a press through the middle of the hair like this. You know, like both sides of your hair here. You know the symptom before anybody ever told you this? Here, they were cutting right here, they were like a like a highway to build on your head. Just to, to insult you, to, to, to press you, to do anything they could to knock you down, to, 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 to teach you wasting on you. The same thing happened in Yugoslavia. They they claimed during the Nazi era they didn't have no television, they didn't know anything. Now everybody sees it, everybody knows, look what happened. Look what happened in the Middle East, look what happened in Africa, look what happened in the Balkan countries, Yugoslavia, that they're finding uh, all kind of mass grave. Did you read it last night? Mass grave with thousands of people. So I guess the, the Second World War was not a lesson, though. And mind you, these countries were involved also during the Second World War with killing. And now they're revenging each other. The Serbs were killing the Groats, the Groats were killing the Serbs. The same, you know, here we are. So the I guess the world didn't learn anything, the people didn't learn anything. Hateness is still involved. Hateness is still existence. Prejudice is still existence. No end to it.